So hello and welcome. I'm Maggie Onisargan, the Public Programs and Relations Manager here at the Ameren Museum. Thank you for joining us today for the origins of Maya civilization examined at Aguada Fenix, Mexico with Dr. Takeshi Inomata. Before we begin our program, I would like to acknowledge that the Amarind is located in Southern Arizona on lands where the Otham, Hopi, Oshwi, Ioeme, and Apache families have lived for untold generations and whose wisdom and traditions live on today in vibrant communities. We are grateful for what all these communities rich in history have to teach us. We would also like to thank all our members and donors who enable the Amarind to provide this free online program and fulfill Ameren's mission to foster and promote the knowledge and understanding of the native peoples of the Americas through research, education, conservation, and community engagement. To learn how you can assist the Ameren in supporting its mission and programs by becoming a member or donor, please visit ameren.org. Please visit our website, ameren.org, and our Facebook page for details on upcoming lectures and artist talks that are in the works. If you would like to ask any questions today, please type your questions in the chat box and I will gather those questions to share with our speaker after his presentation. Also a reminder that the link to the recording of today's program will be sent to all the registrants and also available to watch on our YouTube channel. So we are very honored today to have Dr. Inamata here to share his knowledge with all of us. Dr. Inamata is a professor of anthropology at the University of Arizona. He earned his PhD in anthropology from Vanderbilt University and his bachelor's and master's from the University of to Tokyo. He has worked at the Maya sites of Aguateca and Cibal, Guatemala, and sites in Tabasco and Aguada Fenix, Mexico. He has won numerous awards and accolades and is highly respected throughout the world for his archeological discoveries and work in the Maya region. He has written extensively on Mesoamerica and the Maya. Today, he will be speaking on recent findings from the site of Aguada Fenix, Mexico, which was discovered in 2018, and how the results of the investigation of this site are changing our understanding of how the Maya civilization and surrounding societies developed. So please welcome Dr. Professor Inamata. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. I would like to thank the Amerind Museum for this kind invitation. And thank you everybody for coming to this online event. Let me share the screen. I hope you can see it. So today I'd like to talk about our recent investigation at the site of Aguada Phoenix and talk about what it tells us about the origin of Maya civilization. So when we talk about the Maya civilization, most people think about the classic period, particularly its heyday around eighth century. There were lots of sites with beautiful carvings, inscriptions, and then those uh, high temples. This is the famous site of Tikal with those uh, big temples. But now we are finding out that there were even larger constructions long time before, uh, several various centuries before uh, this uh, classic period. That's about 1000 BC. This gives us a very important implication, not only about the origin of Maya civilization, but about the nature of human society and the process of development of civilization in general. So traditional view was that the human society initially developed gradually. There was a small village, it grew to a bigger town, then you start to have hierarchical organization. Then you, people thought, then you have large constructions. But now we are getting new archeological evidence from around the world, which shows that the larger construction emerged before hierarchical organization. So this really forced us to rethink about the process of 
the development of human society. But first, uh, let me give you a general background. So Agua de Phoenix is located here in the southern part of Mexico, today's uh, state of uh, Tabasco. Actually, we started to walk there in 2017. We went there because of our previous study at the site of Cebal here in Guatemala. The reason we went to this area in Tabasco is that we wanted to see the relation between Olmec civilization and Maya civilization. This relation was a really a, a perpetual problem in Mesoamerican archaeology. There are some important Olmec sites, including San Lorenzo and La Venta. There has been lots of debate. So Olmec people may say, we influence the Maya so that they can become a civilization. Maya people may say, no, we didn't get the influence from Olmecs. We developed independently. Of course, this is what archaeologists has been talking about. And then this is the debate among scholars, which still uh, is continuing on. So to think about this uh, question, we should think about this historical process. The earliest Olmec center is this San Lorenzo. It is actually the probably the earliest large center in entire Mesoamerica. There's this enormous plateau at this site, and then it was dotted by this enormous colossal head sculpture, which was depicting probably a rulers of Ormex society, which dates to about 1400 to a little bit before 1000 BC. During this time in Maya area, there's not much going on or not much to talk about, about the civilization because there were not many really sites to talk about besides small settlements or campsites. And then the Maya people are not even using ceramics at that time. All we found is this kind of lithic tool Basically, Maya people were doing hunting gathering along with small scale maize cultivation, moving around within the jungle and the other areas. So the difference at this point between Olmec society and the Maya society was pretty big. The situation changed a little bit after 1000 BC. That's a time period we call the middle formative period. San Lorenzo declined, and then next we have next Olmec center, La Venta. La Venta looks a little bit different from San Lorenzo. Now they have big pyramid, and then those mound arranged along the north-south line. In the center of this site, the so-called E group, with Western Pyramid and the Eastern Long Platform. So this kind of site formation with E group and then this North-South orientation with many pla uh, platform is called by John Clark, the middle formative Chiapas Param, which maybe said uh, MFC Param. And at this site too, we find this colossal head depicting Olmec rulers. And then also we have this kind of cache with many of them containing greenstone or jade axes. So when we talk about the relation between Maya and the Olmec, people are often talking about the relation with La Venta site. At, but at this time, after 1000 BC, Maya people started to use ceramics. And then various parts, we start to have some small sites. But recently, we start to finding out that there are some substantial construction also starting in Maya area that was found at this site at Seibao, where we worked. 
actually Seibao may date even earlier than the heyday of La Venta, dating to about 950 BC. So as I said, originally I worked at the site of Seibao. Seibao has a long history of occupation continuing into the classic period. So at the end, the site looked like this. We thought this arrangement reflected the original plan of Seibao. And then through excavation, we did confirm that this kind of arrangement existed starting around 950 BC. In the center, we have again E group with Western pyramid and the Eastern long platform. And then other platforms are arranged along the north south line. So originally, some people thought this kind of arrangement started at La Venta and then came to Maya area. But say, uh, E group and uh, this formation of Seibao probably started earlier than La Venta starting around 950. But still, San Lorenzo is earlier. So this relation between Olmec and the Maya is pretty complex. It's not the simple one directional inference. It's not the, just the independent development of Maya society. So we wanted to study this issue furthermore. So, and then we thought to examine this question, we should go to this further to the west, this area between Omec and then Sebal and the other site. So at that point, we didn't know about Agua de Phoenix. Not, nobody knew about Agua de Phoenix. It was not really known. Actually, we started to work at this in this area, which we call Middle Usmacinta area. Then we discovered this site of Agua de Phoenix. Actually, uh, in this talk, I will try to show that Agua de Phoenix is even earlier than Seibao. They starting before 1000 BC, and then it is an enormous site. So this is the image of Agua de Phoenix. We found this site uh, through the process of LIDAR, which is the airborne laser mapping. Basically using the small airplane, you shoot many laser beams and then create accurate three-dimensional view. So with this mapping, we found this site of Agua de Phoenix. The center of the site is this enormous plateau, which measures 1.4 kilometer long and then 400 meter wide. And then there's another huge platform, even taller one measuring about 16 meter high to the west. And then there are many causeways and the corridors to the west and then to the north and then also to the south. <clears throat> and this site, as you see, has uh, arrangement a little bit similar to Seibal and La Venta. In the central part, we have E group. In this case, we have two Western pyramid and then this long Eastern platform, which measures four meter long. And then there's a, this rectangular form, which is very characteristic of this site. So we thought, and this is a variation of the pattern of MFC pattern. Then we decided to call this pattern middle formative Usmacinta pattern, MFU pattern. Then looking at the site, uh, there are several important questions. So LIDAR just give you the superficial uh, shape. Then the important question is how big is it really? Uh, including the build up and then construction volume of these buildings. And then when was it built? And then what was, it, what was the function of those buildings? And then 
also who made this enormous building. In this talk, let me talk about these issues in order. Let's look at this question of how big it was. So we, have, we know the horizontal dimension, but the question is how big in terms of build up. So we had to do deep excavation to go through all the inst, uh, construction sequence. So we did this deep excavation, which takes a long time. You have to be very careful uh, by shoring up those excavation walls. And as you dig, it has to become smaller. But eventually we got down to the bedrock. Uh, so it was four, eight meter deep excavation. So there's a pretty substantial build up. And then based on these results, we could now calculate the construction value of middle formative construction, which was uh, 3.6 million cubic meter. Uh, that's enormous construction, which probably took 11 million thousand days. We don't know how many days they worked, but they mu the mass being the mass having lots of people working on this construction. So this tells us that Agua de Phoenix was one of the biggest structures in entire Mesoamerican history. Uh, the only bigger one maybe the, is that this uh, pyramid at Cholula, but the Cholula pyramid was built up over a long time period, and then it's much later. And the, another big site is San Lorenzo, which may be about the same size uh, in terms of the size of this main plateau. So after the decline of San Lorenzo and the Aguada Phoenix was functioning, uh, this main plateau of Aguada Phoenix must have been the biggest structure, biggest functioning structure at that time in Mesoamerica. It is surprising that uh, we didn't know about this big site, but this is a huge site. So that's what we learned is that those big sites are even difficult, more difficult to recognize because if you walk on it, it just looks like a, just a natural uh, landscape. And then it's so big horizontally that you cannot really recognize this rectangular form. This form came out only clearly, only through our LIDAR survey that happened in 2017. Then big question was, when was it built? To examine this question, of course, we had to do excavation and then examine ceramics, but also important information come from radiocarbon dates. So each of these represent individual radiocarbon date. <clears throat> and then this black area represent the possible date range of this uh, radiocarbon date. So at the end of this, at the bottom of this excavation, we found a midden light on the bedrock. Those midden gave a date series of date around 1200 BC. So middle include ceramics. So people were around here were using ceramics before the rest of Maya area. Ceramic didn't start in many other parts of Maya area until 1000 BC. But this was before the construction of plateau. This date that came from the construction field is about 1100 to 1050. That might be the beginning of the plateau construction. Further up, we have series of date around 1000 BC. So in a relatively short time period, in the initial construction, they put, built up almost six meters, a little bit more. Uh, was a, pretty big construction. Then after that, they put 
add our layers little by little. You see those sequence of date. And then after 800 or 750 BC, this construction almost stopped. So this enormous construction happened in a relatively short period of three or four centuries. So this is the excavation in the southern part of the plateau. If we see the central part, the pattern is a little bit different. On the bedrock, we have this black soil, which gave us the date a little bit later than the southern part, about 1,950. That must be the initial construction in the central part. And then this nice floor that gave the date of about 950 to 900 or so. So what was going on is something like this. If we see the cross section along this plateau, it looked like this. So this vertical dimension is exaggerated. So underneath it, you have this bedrock. So now we know that they built this plateau in this natural height of bedrock. So around 1200 BC, it was a natural landscape like this. And then they deposit in some area medium with ceramics. Then around 1100 or 1050, they started, suddenly started the, this big construction. <clears throat> In the initial construction, they focused on this area, southern part and the possibly northern part to build up this lower part and then make this flat plateau. So in the initially, uh, they built up this area in a pretty big construction. Then in the central part, originally higher part, there's not, not much going on at this point. Then once they built initial form, they started to build up the entire plateau. And then 975 or so, very after 1000 BC, they built up the entire plateau. So that in terms of vertical dimension, it's not much, but as a construction volume of the entire plateau, it must have been pretty big work too. So this tells us that there's an enormous construction in this period between about 1100 to 800 BC. That's the period after or around the time of decline of San Lorenzo and then around the time of the rise of La Venta. So we did, before our study, we didn't understand this period, this gap between San Lorenzo and La Venta. Now we see that Agua de Phoenix was the major center during this period, which is even earlier than this Seibao. Then the next question is, what was the function of these buildings? What they built those things for? To ask this question, key point is this E group. And then our excavation was a major part of our excavation focused on this E group because we knew that the E group was the, really the center of many sites. Actually, E group found uh, many Maya sites and then also the uh, site in Chiapas and the even in Olmec area. Many of them are later than E group at Seibao and Agoda Phoenix, but E group became a very popular format throughout the Maya area and the Southern Mesa America. And then we knew that um, many places, E group was really the focus of communal ritual. For example, at Seibao, we found this initial form of E group dating to about 950 BC. Western pyramid was still pretty small. And then we have this Eastern platform. 
then along the center line of this E group, we found lots of those caches. Caches containing those green stone and jade axes. So this really tells us this center line is the really important place that's a focus of communal activity. So initial question for us was that, the, do we have the same pattern at Agua de Phoenix? So we did these excavations. Initially, we did this excavation in the central part of the E-Group Plaza. And then we didn't find any ritual deposit. Uh, so that was a little bit discouraging, but we thought we should try another location. We put another excavation here closer to Eastern uh, platform. And then here we did find many deposit. Past one was found in year 2000. This was the cache containing various jade axes and then this so-called uh, perforator originally probably had a pointed end. It may have been used for blood letting rituals. Similar object have been found at some Maya sites and the Olmec sites. So this probably dates to about 850 BC. Then next to this deposit, we found another deposit. This one contained uh, 11 ceramic vessels, many of those jars. And then in the center, we had this ball. This also dated about 850 BC. The center of this cache was this ball, obviously. Uh, Daniela Triadan uh, reconstructed this vessel. And then this is a really a beautiful vessel. It's relatively simple, this because it's very old, but you see that there are very fine incisions. It has those cross hatches and then lines. This is the rollout view of these vessels. We don't know really what those uh, patterns mean, but it must have had some kind of symbolic meaning. And then this is a pretty elaborate vessel. And then after the break, because of the COVID uh, pandemic, we, came, we went back to the site last year in 2022 and then continued the excavation of same area and then found this cache. Um, this area has been excavated uh, by Medina uh, Garcia. So in this cache, we found this object and then those smaller uh, jade object. This was originally a jade axis and then they cut the axis and then made those incisions. Uh, you see these legs and then the mouth, nose, and then some pattern, scale-like pattern. Uh, this is probably a representation of crocodile or could be lizard or more likely crocodile. Then uh, we continued this excavation this year, 2000. Uh, 23 from February to April. Then this year we found this cache in this cruciform pattern with those axes. And then center we had the those object. This shape, uh, we are not sure what this represent. It has those fine incisions. And then this is a so-called spoon type uh, pectoral, actually there are perforations, probably people wore this on the chest. Also, we found those caches in the same area. This was the uh, uh, cache with those axes arranged in the petal form. Probably this part was cut by another later cache, which is this one, which shows uh, again, cruciform pattern. Again, in the center, we have this shallow pit with 
more object. If we see some of those objects, they look like this. Those are relatively unique objects. Actually, you, there's a perforation that goes through from side to side, and then here too. So it must have been part of ornament that people used. It may have been part of headband or armband. Uh, then there's not, there are not many known examples of this form. There are few from possibly from Omec area. This is another uh, one of this uh, spoon shape a pectoral with perforation on the top part. This one represent probably the shape of parrot. But particularly remarkable object from this cache was this pendant. It was really nicely shaped and the polished uh, really in a th very thin form. And then they cut through this thin jade plaque to make this form. Uh, we had to look at it really well at the beginning to understand it. But you see these dots, those are eyes. And then this line, that's mouth. Probably this is human face. Then this is a torso. And then those are arms. And then these must be legs. These are legs. So what we're looking at here must be a female in a birth giving position, probably. And then you can see some red pigment in some area in the close up, you can see better. It had some red pigment. And we found it and it looked like this. It was broken, this part. So Danny put this together. We originally thought that this broke after it was deposited because of weight of the object I feel on top of it. But if you see it, uh, there are those notches. There's this notch, this notch. But on the other side, we don't have notches. So actually what may have happened is that after they almost finished it, the artisan started to make those notches and then making this notch and then it broke possibly. So they stopped, they didn't make those notches and then probably it was deposited without being warm by anybody possibly. So they must have spent lots of time to make this beautiful object. And then in the last moment, it possibly broke. That really sucks, but uh, still it was very beautiful, important object. And then this was the center of this cache. This is a very unique object. There are not really many known examples. The only example, similar example I know of is this example that's housed in Metropolitan Museum of Art. It has a Sims, same kind of shape, also very thin, and then those cut out forms. Uh, just the uh, inside motif is different. So this matte piece is unprovenienced piece, but uh, this may have been made in the set about uh, this middle Usmacinta area, and then it got looted and uh, housed in this museum. So let me go back and talk about this process of excavation. So we started this excavation in 2000 and then expanded this excavation to this rectangular form in 2022. And then in the center, we have this trench that marked trench made by ancient people that apparently marked this east-west axis. So we are looking toward east in this picture. Here we found some cache, we found this vessel cache here, but also we noticed this cut, square cut going here. And then this cut continued this way outside of this excavation area. 
like this. So when we looked at it, we thought there was there might be possibly a cruise form, big cruise form intrusion. So this year we decided to expand this excavation to see if there's a this cruise form excavation. In this process, in this area, we found uh, those many more cases that, that I talked about. And then we did if, indeed found uh, those this cruise form cache, which is pretty deep. It took us a long time to dig it. And at the bottom, Oh. And uh, um, during this season, we are planning to go to a meeting of uh, Society of American Archaeology, but this excavation never ended, so we had to cancel the, our trip to SA meeting, and then we continued to die. Then eventually we got to the bottom. So this is what we found. Uh, this is the composite composite uh, 3D uh, model that we made. So at the end, at the bottom, we have this smaller crystal head. At the bottom, we have we found this. So when we saw this cruise form fall, big cruise form cut, we wondered there might be a big deposit with lots of like a jade object. But the, what we found was very different. It was a relatively modest deposit. Uh, in a sense, it's some people may think it's disappointing, but actually for us, that's pretty rewarding because this is a very unique deposit, uh, ritual deposit. There's nothing like this that we know about before this family. But before we talk, I talk more about this deposit, let me go back a little bit and then talk about this level. When we get to this floor, we can see this cut, this form cut, which is not excavated yet. But we see this part here and here. If we go closer, you see that we need to pass a back shape. It's actually made of clay and then painted in red. So this is interesting. So this means that people at Colorado Phoenix knew about the axe caches, but they didn't have much access to greenstone axes at this point. That was probably around the line to see. Then the central part, we didn't, we don't have green star axis. Instead, we have these marine shells to the west and the south. We didn't find anything here. Probably it's a lot of uh, organic material here and here. And then there was this beautiful pigment to the north, east, and the south, marking some kind of directional uh, symbols. Here we didn't have anything. There's a probably a organic material which has disintegrated, and then this was filled by film three. So you may remember that the later Maya people had a little bit different directional color symbols. North and white in the north, red in the east, just the yellow in the south is the same. But the, this north is part is different. <clears throat> so this tells us that this kind of symbolism continued, but the detail changed over time. It just uh, these pigments are stunning, beautiful. After 3,000 years, he retained his vivid charm. So this pigment are made on this sort of like the this rectangular, like a cake or pastel kind of things. And then we dug through it, then we found something like this. 
again, we have spill material in the center, which means that there's an organic material here in the center. And at the bottom, the bedrock was carved in this you know, form. So it's this form in the bedrock, which tells us that they cut this thing and then there's a, some kind of wooden pole in the center. And then they later fill in. So this original uh, deposit was about 900 BC. At that time, they didn't have green stone. Probably they didn't have much access to green stone. Then let me go over this process again. After it was filled, they started, well, sorry. Then uh, this is the view. Actually, on the full side, they have this access way with, with those steps. So people could come in through these steps to this deep hole and then did this ritual. Again, if we go through this sequence after this crystal pit was filled, they put this jade axis. Now they started to have better access to the green stone and jade. The next, we have this deposit with this pendant. Then also we have this crystal deposit. Another one is with crocodile that we talked about. And then this one was pointed object. Toward the end, there was a, this ceramic object. We don't know the exact order, but ceramics deposit must be toward the end of the sequence. This whole thing, sequence happened in a relatively short time period, around 850 BC. So this was a very important ritual place, but also we can see that from this direction. We see this igloo, and then this structure further to the west. Can we connect it? Uh, and then this direction was studied by Ivan Sprach. And then it shows that this is aligned with the orientation of sunrise on February 24th and the October 17th. Those two dates are separated by 130 days. You know that 130 days is a half, half of 260 days important cycle of Mesoamerican current. And then also we see that there are 20 edge platform on this main platform, which must represent this base unit of current and population. So this represents really the earliest evidence of 260-day current. So all this site were tied to this calendrical concept and the ritual. So this place was mainly a ritual place. And then of this date, this February 24th must be a particularly important day. That's a hype of dry season, which we can tell from this kind of arrangement. This is the view from the east. We have those long causeways. And not really a causeway because it's not built up. If we see the cross section, they actually dug into the ground and then piled up soil on the side. It's a pretty big construction, and this one goes on almost six kilometers. But as it is dug in, this is actually not usable during the rainy season, if you want the rainy season in this area. It's going to be muddy and the full of water. And if you see this, another horrible that goes through the wetland. Well, in the when it's dry in the, during the dry season, we can walk through it. But wet, in the wet uh, season, this is all swamp. So, for this corridor, must be important part of ritual, which involves the procession. But that ritual must have happened during the dry season. So people probably gathered in this place at the height of dry, dry season. And then after that, people went back to their village. So there was a seasonal gathering and ritual at this place, particularly dry season. 
and then the people who gathered here were still mobile people, which can tell from pattern of study of, of LIDAR, which we conducted, which we analyzed for the wide area, including from the air. So here in this study area, you have San Lorenzo, under the Phoenix, and then throughout this area, we found the many sites which are similar to our Phoenix, not as big as our Phoenix, but similar. Many of them were not known before our study. Many of them have rectangular shape with e group like this. And then San Lorenzo too, people didn't notice it, but the main form of San Lorenzo also is the rectangular form with 20 edge platform. Just they don't have e group. And then to the south, we have similar form, which were not known before this analysis. All the way to the southwestern part of the area, we have the same pattern. So people shared those uh, ritual forms, and then people are moving around, and then gathered for those big site of our phoenix for important rituals. Then at the end, important question is who made it? As I said, this kind of evidence tells us that the people who built our the Phoenix was still mobile population. There may have been some uh, sedentary people, but that's a minority. We know that also from our excavation of residential structures. We couldn't find red, many residential structures at this site because they didn't build substantial residences because people are still moving around. So what we found is something like this, pretty modest. It just carved out of bedrock and then covered by soil later on so we cannot see it from the ground. Along with it, we can see that the crop is at, uh, they didn't have pronounced social inequality. At least we don't have evidence for pronounced social inequality. Uh, that comes from this kind of residential settlement data, but also comes from the data of sculpture and iconography. Important find came from this outside of this plateau area. Here we found this sculpture, which, is, which we call Chaco. It's a representation of white lived pattern, pretty naturalistic representation. This art form is very different from all mechanical. Typical mechanical is like this. This colossal head that depict rulers and then those monstrous figures which depicts supernatural being. So this kind of iconography must have been tied to the power of Lura. Depiction of Lura and then depiction of this supernatural being, which is detached, different from people's everyday experience, and then it's controlled by the power of Lura and other people. It's different. It's a naturalistic depiction of um, animals based on everybody's daily experience. It's more probably an animistic religion, or in a sense, more democratic form of religion, if you will. Same pattern can be seen in this green form, greenstone artifact. Omec, from Omec area, Greenstone artifact will depict those supernatural forms. Uh, the site of Japan Coso also shows this presence of supernatural being, probably specifically tied to the power of good. Greenstone object from Agua de Phoenix depict those natural being like a crocodile or even human form of past giving female. So that's, there was very different religious worldview between Omec uh, people and the Phoenix people. 
So those when we compare omic and agorophrenix, there's a lot of sharing of cultural element. They are subtly connected, start particularly sharing of spatial pattern like those site forms and then certain ritual practices. But they were different in terms of social organization. Omic people had rulers and the centralized party. And with the Phoenix, they didn't have pronouns, I write. And they along with it, symbolism and ideology were different. So in the summary, the Phoenix social organization consisted of large portion of mobile population and the important part of communal activity. People get together and then collaborate. That doesn't mean there were no community leaders. There were community leaders and that they were probably responsible for calendar, astronomy, and the organizing ritual and the construction project. But they were not rulers. They didn't have much power like rulers. So that led to the later development of Maya civilization. Maya people later on, like what the Phoenix people did, selectively adapted symbolic and political concept. They didn't adapt it everything, but eventually Maya Luda emerged based on probably this form of community leader of our Phoenix and the other sites. They were tied to calendar astronomy and then Maya Luda were organized of rituals, primary priest, and then they were organized of construction projects. But the importance of this community, communal, collective activity continued on in my society, even after they cut my movements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Let me read you some questions. Um, so one from Joel, I'm wondering if Aguada Phoenix is in the low elevation passage between the San Pedro and Candelaria that Cortez used in 1524. Have you examined this, Joel? Sorry, I couldn't hear it well. Can you repeat the, the question? Yes, so Joel is wondering if Aguada Phoenix Phoenix is in the low elevation passage between the San Pedro and Candelaria that Cortez used in 1524. Have you examined this? I, seen, I seem to have some audio problem. Let me check. Sure. Can you try again? Okay. He's wondering if Aguada Phoenix is in the low elevation passage between the San Pedro and Candelaria that Cortez used in 1524. And have you examined this? Um, it's Aguada Phoenix is yeah right on the uh, San Pedro River, and then basically. I'm not sure exactly the same on the route that the Cortez used, but it's close enough. And uh, so that was the, probably the major reason that the Aguada Phoenix uh, located at that place. So it can go you, from Aguada Phoenix, you can go to the central part of Petén following San Pedro, and then to the north uh, following this uh, corridor you can go to Candelaria and then go to the northern uh, part of Maya area. And then to the west, following Cande San Pedro and the Sumacinta uh, River, you can go to uh, Omec area. 
And another one from Henry, can you speculate why they built such a large feature settlement in this particular spot? Wow, that's a big question. So um, I don't know exactly, but uh, so this is the moment of major social change. People are starting to adopt intensive form of maize agriculture. People started to adopt sedentary uh, lifestyle and then population was growing. And then this was key moment of social change. And then similar things happened throughout the world, various parts of the world, not just like what the Phoenix. Uh, in this moment of social change in various places like Peru and the Southwest Asia, they started to build big monument, and then even in North America too. Why people did it, that's still a big question, but it seems to tell us the importance of this communal activity. Building, if we tell people to organize society, that's very abstract things. Uh, it's hard to do, to think about just a form of society. But building is something concrete. And if you say, let's build something big, that gives people concrete idea, concrete object, object, uh, objective that people can share and then work together for. Then that's what happened. I'm not saying that always happened, but that's the, something that the people can do at this major point of social change. And then in some parts of the world, including our the Phoenix, that kind of things happened. And one from Maria, regarding the largest pyramids you mentioned, Chahula and Aguada Phoenix, how does La Danta and Al Mirador compare? So before the find of uh, Aguada Phoenix, La Danta complex at El Mirador that dates to late pre-classic period was the biggest building known in the Maya area. Aguada Phoenix is bigger, measuring about 3.6 million uh, cubic meters. Danta is about 2 million or probably less if you calculate the, the height of bedrock. So Agua the Phoenix is certainly bigger, but Dante is pretty big, but still bigger. Agua the Phoenix is bigger. Also Agua the Phoenix is bigger than uh, Pyramid of, of Sun at Teotihuacan, more than double the size. And one from Joey, uh, the Jade Crocodile from the Cash NR6 looks very similar to the Olmec Earth Monster or the Olmec dragon, do you think there was some cross-cultural sharing in art styles or at least some influence? So the crocodile was important for all Mesoamerican people. And that there has to be a certain sharing of concept. And then there's a loose similarity between this piece, I the Phoenix piece and the Olmec dragon, but specific part is different. Omic dragon has this uh, fine eyebrow or oh, that this mouse, which looks like a dragon, it's representation of supernatural form, not the representation of crocodile. But at Aguada Phoenix, they don't show that kind of specific Omic feature or supernatural feature that distinguish naturalistic crocodile and the other things. So that's the key difference for me. There are some similarities, but the Olmec, this mythical creature was tied to magical power of Lura, but Agua the Phoenix, we don't have Lura. And uh, that's tied to people's view of the world, everybody's view of the world, including crocodile, peccary, those natural beings, which had probably had spirits and then people had more animistic uh, belief system. And one from Erica, fantastic find those pigments. Do you know what minerals they are? Oh, pigments. 
So we just found that uh, we have to bring it to the states and then do analysis. We are still in the process, but we are pretty sure the blue is probably argillite, uh, green is probably malachite. We have to confirm that through the scientific analysis, but that's the most likely thing. Yellow must be a yellow ochre. That's uh, probably the uh, oxidized iron uh, clay. And I noticed a lot of layers varying in color and texture. Can you please explain these many layers? Yes. So there are many various parts. There are many of those layers. Actually, they put, probably they put uh, clay on the soil of different color intentionally. I didn't talk much about it, but in some area, we see uh, almost like a checkerboard pattern, red here, black there, white there, and then on top of it, you put another layer with a different color. And then eventually that's within the construction field. Then eventually it was sealed by white uh, floor. So they built this enormous construction, but just not throwing into throwing whatever they can get. They did a very careful construction, choosing specific color, and then made a very elaborate construction, even within the construction field, which is really a remarkable thing. So one last question as we're running out of time, but someone asked, what are the best ways for us to keep up with these discoveries? What journals, websites, et cetera? Et cetera? I can also add that to my email if you wanna send me oh, that. Um, we are uh, still working on uh, publication. We have uh, published some of the results. Uh, we, I put the basic reference in the slide. If you go back to this slide, uh, you can see the specific reference you, can, you wanna see. Uh, it's gonna take a few more years to publish this uh, most recent uh, result. We have to do more specific analysis. We have to get a more specific radiocarbon date. What we talked about is still a preliminary interpretation. Uh, so um, if we publish, make a formal publication, uh, probably it, uh, it comes out in uh, uh, two years or so. Meanwhile, you can look at, if you like, you can look at our Spanish informer, which will put up in the University of Arizona uh, repository, which is, has open access. As we prepare them, we put those informer on the university repository, which everybody can access. Professor Inamata, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. And we really look forward to hearing, you know, your what comes next with your research. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, everybody.